so um, now we are in uh, in the final part of this webinar, which is uh, um, uh, the round table and then the Q&A sessions. Uh, before starting this part, uh, let me introduce you uh, two new speakers that will join our round table. So Sean and Jeron, you, you already know. Um, so the first one is uh, uh, um, Emilios uh, Muchataropoulos, sorry for the pronunciation, uh, and uh, Caetano Ois. So uh, Emilios is, uh, uh, is a co-founder and head of marketing of Roy Urban Technologies, which is a top Greek startup which is working in the field of mobility and energy. Uh, Emilios graduated in civil engineer from the University of Thessaloniki with, uh, uh, with specialization in transportation planning. Uh, he has worked in the construction and transportation sector, and then he has wide experience uh, in the field of re research, sales, communication and, and finance. Uh, welcome, Emilius. Um, the other speaker will be, as I mentioned, Caetano Hoyos. So um, Caetano is participating in multiple product innovation actions um, for uh, design and building at the Sormar shipyard, which he joined in uh, 2018. Uh, and uh, within uh, Sormar, he has been involved in numerous European funded projects, uh, such as the Horizon 2020 ship lease and the Horizon 2020 fiber ship. Uh, Caetano, additionally, he has also been involved in several feasibility studies and research and innovation projects related to new prototypes with potential for inclusion in, in the market. Uh, welcome Caetano and, and Emilius and thank you for, uh, for joining us today. So um, I, would, uh, I would start from uh, some questions that I noticed some uh, of the attendees posted. Um, uh, so far, both of them are, are I think for you, Sean. Um, so uh, I would start from, from the first one. Um, so here they, um, I think in, in your presentation it was not uh, not covered. So um, uh, what type of ships are you are you aiming in terms of in terms of uh, size and industry? Um, could you provide some uh, um, some details on that? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Tommaso, and thank you for the question. Uh, it, obviously, it wasn't possible to cover everything in in our presentation in detail, but we are. One of our deliverables is a deep study into the applicability of swappable battery containerized solutions, um, primarily focused on the inland waterway market and coastal shipping or short sea shipping, as others call it. Um, so far, we've completed the analysis of the inland waterway market. Um, we were very privileged to get access to the IVR ship registration database. And really that gave us access to over 15,000 inland waterway vessels covering both uh, passenger, dry cargo, uh, tanker vessels, tugs and pusher boats. Um, we were able to analyze that database uh, because it contained information like powering requirements and main engine sizes. So if we take our one megawatt container as a building block, we could start looking at the feasibility of how many containers would we need to meet the powering requirement and then it becomes a function of energy uh, is how long uh, can we propel those vessels on true zero emissions before we have to uh, undertake a swapping operation so at the moment in terms of types of ships we're, we're assessing all inland waterway ships um, there are some ships just because of their physical size that are not within scope, i.e. they cannot accommodate a container on their deck or a 20 foot container. And then also there's some limitations on structural impact and dead weight impact, where again, we have to filter out that database of 15,000 vessels to come up with a more credible number. Uh, right now we're looking at a very high applicability percentage, somewhere in the region of 60 to 70% of all those vessels assessed would be suitable with a uh, swappable battery solution. They all have their own challenges in terms of re-engining, repowering and, and transforming some of these from a tr traditional direct drive solution to an electrified solution. But that again is part of our business model where we'd look to finance and facilitate some of that infrastructure investment on retrofitting ships. 
Our analysis of the short sea shipping market has really just begun. It's a much more dynamic and challenging fleet um, with very varied operational profiles and powering demands. Um, I'm hoping then certainly by the end of this year we will have that market assessment completed, uh, at which point we can share a lot more information um, with 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 people who are interested to understand. What I can say in parallel as well is we've been looking at vessel routes. So as you can imagine, the energy demand really depends on how far you want to go for how long and at what speed. So we've been referencing a, a previous EU study called um, the Prominent Study on looking at over 29 candidate routes with real world operating vessels and analysing how many containers and how many swapping operations would be needed. And again, that's results we will be looking to share uh, as we move through the project. So hopefully that provides some context for the ship types and types of routes we're targeting. Um, it looks very promising at this stage. Thank you, Sean. So um, since you're here, another another question for you from the audience. Um, so uh, um, this question addresses the uh, which is the operating range foreseen for the demonstration vessel and also which is the energy content and peak out power output. Thank you. Yeah, again, a, a, another good question. So one of the uh, so the demonstrator vessel, as I mentioned in the presentation, will be a Kotuk, and this is their modular e push off vessel, which is a, a really innovative design. It's it's intentionally designed to operate on swappable energy sources, so it doesn't have a fixed engine room. Um, one of the beauties of that design is it has a it can support a very wide range of operational profiles. Um, from a couple of hours with a fairly arduous profile, maybe with some port operations, uh, moving goods around, all the way to a much more longer duration, um, moving goods along the inland waterway network. So we're working with Kotuk and the port authorities to really determine which profiles um, fit within the swappable battery solution. Um, and also working out which profiles we would look to be demonstrating during the demonstration phase to provide the greatest degree of confidence for the performance of the battery system. Um, we know we're limited on power with our one megawatt per container, but there's nothing stopping us in combining multiple containers together to provide additional power and additional energy uh, on that particular vessel. So again, we're looking at the routes with Kotuk. We're looking at what the vessel can credibly do on absolute zero emissions and then looking at what swapping operations are needed to support that operational range. Thank you again, Sean. So um, there is also uh, there are also a couple of questions for uh, uh, on C, but uh, I think Jeron, if you are available, you could answer them. So uh, the first one would be um, what battery cell chemistries are being considered for the hybrid, hybrid energy storage system? And then maybe this one uh, could be connected also to the following question, which is, um, so one is on the cell chemistries and the other one is, uh, given this hybrid energy storage system, how do you approach to manage the level of state of charge and state of health with uh, multiple cell types? Yes. Well, thank you for the question. It's very interesting. Um, so let's first tackle the cell chemistries. Actually, we try to keep that question open as long as possible. Um, so the aim is that, that the architecture, the concept that we're developing is suitable for battery cells of different chemistries, such that if in the future a new battery cell uh, arrives, it could also be integrated in this existing architecture and in this, this existing design. So in that sense, uh, I want to keep that option uh, out of the way or want to keep that option open as long as possible. But of course, today we need to make a decision on which cells we want to use uh, to move forward because we also want to bring this to reality. Uh, and I can tell you that today we are considering NMC cells and LTO cells uh, as the most interesting, well, cell types. Uh, and we're looking at availability, which is proving to be the most difficult part uh, in which specific cells then from which manufacturers we choose to actually build our battery. But other options such as supercapacitors for the high power part, uh, so that's not even a battery cell, uh, have also been considered. 
And then the question with regards to the management system. So indeed, state of charge and state of health uh, becomes a very distributed and complex pro uh, process. Uh, so the idea is actually to move part of this responsibility to the module level. And so by designing the battery as a set of modules which can be combined, the different modules can guard the state of charge and state of health. Of course, this is also linked to the power electronics. So depending on the uh, topology that we choose or the, the concept that we go with, uh, it may be different. For the module level converter and for the partial power converter, it's much more sensible to have the state of charge and state of health actively monitored at the module level because it's also being actively controlled at that level. And the battery as a whole needs a state of charge and needs a state of health as well. But that will be some sort of average of the different modules. While for the discrete solution, especially for the high energy part where each cell is individually switched, uh, it's actually more efficient and, and, and necessary to monitor the state of charge and state of health of every single cell uh, already in the high level control algorithm which decides which cell is active and which cell is not active. Um, so depending on the solution that we go for, a different monitoring algorithm is required. Uh, and perhaps to conclude that answer, we're also working together with other partners and other uh, research uh, projects which are actively looking into state of charge, state of health, state of uh, X uh, monitoring and see if we can use the results there also in our project. Thank you, Jeron. Um, actually, there is a, a, um, another question for you. Uh, which is connected to that slide that you showed in which you were showing the forecasted uh, capacity of uh, um, of the batteries into waterborne transport and they were, they were divided into those uh, three parts from uh, 0.1 until one megawatt hour and then between one and three megawatt hours and then larger than three. So as you I think you mentioned in, in your presentation that the one that has the clearest um, in, let's say increase uh, in the next years will be uh, between one and three, which is actually what the uh, call is targeting. Um, do you know uh, maybe first of all, if if you could share the sources of uh, of your uh, um, forecast and then the other question is more if you if you if you have a reason or if you, uh, I mean, of course, this is your opinion, but if you have an, an, an opinion in why uh, the other two segments uh, have uh, limited growth compared to uh, to the one between one and three megawatts. Yeah, sure, I'll, uh, I'll have a go at it. It's a much more, much more complex question. Uh, and the answer is actually described in our deliverable 1.2, which is uh, approximately 100 pages long. So I'll try to give you the main, the main summary and the main takeaway. Uh, but actually, the figure I showed is, is the average forecast. Uh, and in the deliverable, there are three forecasts. There is the minimum, the average, and the maximum. Um, and they show slightly different results, but the main takeaway is still that, uh, that the middle section, uh, the middle range uh, seems to be the predominant growing one in the, in the coming future. Uh, and from what I recall, it's primarily due to uh, due to availability of technology. Um, this this also tackled full electrification. So it seems that um, both in, in number of installations and in volume, uh, it seems that this middle category of one to three megawatt hour seems to be the most prone to electrification due to the technology that is available today. Uh, and the higher the higher ranges uh, will probably be more hybrid solutions in the coming future, in the near future. But as mentioned, the full details are in the deliverable, which you can download on our website. So that you can also uh, have a look at how we came to these conclusions. Thank you, Jerome. So um, maybe I would uh, I would ask uh, one uh, one last question for the Q and A. Then we could move to. Uh, some other questions. Uh, I think this one is uh, is for Karen Direct. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, Sean or uh, Emilius would like to uh, to answer that. Um, so um, one question is uh, if you consider local communities along the waterways selling energy as a service using uh, uh, current direct batteries or providing their own. Um, and this one is connected also to, I think, the, the standards that uh, you, Sean, mentioned in uh, uh, in your presentation. Yeah, I'll, 
I'll start and then certainly invite Emilios to to add his comments. It's a it's a really good question. One of the things uh, one of our deliverables is looking at the root infrastructure um, and where swapping stations would need to be located and where charging positions would need to be located. So um, the idea is that we would look to have strategic swapping and strategic charging locations to best serve the, if we think about inland waterway, to serve the network. So we've taken a review of the existing network. Uh, we're also looking at the extended network under the TNT uh, project funded by the European Union. And running through with our partners, ROE, looking at the modelling and simulation of where those swapping operations need to be placed. We would be open under the energy as a service platform, and this is one of the key aspects of that platform, is to facilitating other energy sources under the energy as a service platform. So whilst we will have our own fleet of containers in the network, there's no reason why we can't host and manage other partners networks and uh, containers in the network as well. So that's the beauty of the the energy as a service platform. It provides that business operating model for really the market exploitation of a swappable service, be that a current direct container or a ZDS container or anybody else's container within the network. It's in terms of the eyes of the energy as a service platform, we can just treat that as energy throughput. Um, Emilius, I'd invite you to, to say a few words on that as well. Sean, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. I had a internet connection problem. Can you repeat the question on the topic of the discussion? I just reconnected. Sure, I can uh, I can do it. If you perfect. So um, there was one question from uh, uh, from the attendees, which was connected to uh, the energy as a service. So uh, the question is, if if we consider local communities along the waterways uh, selling energy as a service using um, uh, using our batteries or uh, or providing their own. Um, I think Sean already provided an answer to that. I wanted to know if you had something to uh, to add to it. Thank you. Uh, what was the answer of Sean uh, to that? So I think what we're interested in, Emilius, is um, with your work on the energy as a service platform is how the platform could support other energy carriers, not just a current direct container, but maybe a, a container from another supplier or another provider and whether the architecture will be flexible in its commercialization to support that. I'm suggesting it will be um, so that we can ensure mass exploitation of a swappable solution. Uh, but from your side and from the mechanics of designing such a platform, whether there's any comments from you on that. I totally agree with you. It's something that we have already discussed uh, within the frameworks of Current Direct. Uh, the concept is to the AIS platform to be flexible, to adjust not only Current Direct solutions, but also to uh, adjust in the whole market. I agree with your opinion. Perfect. Thank you, Emilius. Um, so uh, I have I have few more questions, uh, and these ones probably um, I would ask. Uh, uh, I think they are quite general, and they involve both projects. So maybe I would ask first you, Jerome, to answer, and then maybe Sean to give his uh, his view on current direct. So. Um, I think this one was also quite uh, explained during your presentations, which is that uh, one of the key challenges for uh, uh, battery in waterborne transport is the reduction of uh, total cost of ownership compared to, to today's solution. So um, I would like to uh, maybe ask you and if you could summarize uh, what were the key, um, let's say elements in which your projects try to uh, to address this challenge uh, maybe i would start from you jerome if possible thank you sure um so as you mentioned indeed that the tco is very important and for that it's important to understand the challenge that we're facing in the maritime industry um, so as we see it 
one of the key issues is that often um, batteries for ships are built either as signal units or a small series uh, such that there are no economies of scale uh, and that we would try to tackle with the, the modeler well with the architectural concept of course which is suitable for a variety of reasons but also with the modules which can be mass produced uh, cells in which which can be mass produced such that the economies of scale hold true for the um, for the modules at least and then secondly Today, battery systems on ships are, are quite overdimensioned. Uh, in the research that we have done, we've shown, well, in the best case scenarios, twice overdimensioned, but often over a factor of 10 times overdimensioned when it comes to uh, the lifetime which needs to be served. Uh, and that also could be tackled by optimally tuning the amount of high energy and high power cells, which also have a different cycle life. Uh, so that should also drastically reduce the cost. And then, Today, many battery systems are actually not specifically designed or the battery component subsystems are not specifically designed to be used in the maritime industry. Uh, so that's, of course, a common thing we share between Kodak Direct and Seabed is that we are tackling this challenge from the context of the maritime battery. Um, so that, that should also uh, significantly improve the total cost of ownership. And then the costs which can be recuperated at the end of life is perhaps also important to understand uh, when you are monitoring the state of health very closely, especially on the module level, but also on the cell level, uh, it becomes possible to perhaps recuperate certain modules at the end of life and thus also recuperate part of the cost or even exchange faulty cells uh, or faulty modules with new cells and new modules throughout the operation of the battery, uh, such that it becomes much more flexible and much more uh, evident to use this battery for a longer time uh, and to recuperate part of the cost at the end of life or the end of first life, as we then call it. Uh, so that are parts of the solutions for the total cost of ownership optimization. Thank you, Jeron. Sean, would you, would you like to answer this question? Yeah, I can certainly add. Add to what Jerome said, which um, 100% agree with, and some of the points he's picked up on. I'm really pleased that we share uh, the same objective across the two calls um, to reduce the total cost of ownership in some areas. So clearly, you know, we need to do better at reducing the cost of components and materials uh, that go into making a battery system for the maritime industry. Um, really, this starts at cell level, uh, reducing cost of cells. And one of our innovations with Blackstone is is the novel cell manufacturing technique and using 3D printed uh, state of the art line production facilities that can really be um, diverse and adaptable to the needs of the market. So rather than buying cells through uh, other production lines where we have low influence on their um, on the requirements of the cell development, we can really tailor this cell to the maritime industry. And, you know, in contrast to our friends in Seabelt, we're targeting our application very clearly on an energy focused cell and targeting a market segment that is entirely reliant on the energy uh, throughput as opposed to a power slash energy hybrid cell, uh, which I agree with many ship owners try and achieve too many things with one cell. So targeting our application, targeting our market, reducing component costs and also reducing complexity. So as we build up from cell to module to rack, reducing the number of components, simplifying the installation, increasing the speed um, that we can manufacture modules and we can manufacture racks. And then importantly, reducing costs associated with certification uh, and regulatory uh, requirements. Um, this is an area that I think we share between two projects and I think the industry as a whole has a challenge of making sure that regulatory bodies are harmonious between their requirements so that one battery system certified under one regulatory body should not need recertification under another regulatory body, which is a complete duplication of effort and costs. Hence why we seek to develop a standard uh, certification methodology on the back of current direct that our partner Lloyd's can take to IAX and lobby for a unified requirement across all standardization classification societies. This will significantly reduce the cost of bringing batteries to market with the relevant certification. 
And then finally, I, I, I really can't stress enough the power of the energy as a service platform in reducing the total cost of ownership, uh, completely deburdening the end user of the capex expenditure and the heavy high levels of investment currently needed to fit batteries onto a ship and moving that more to a, uh, a paper use, uh, paper lease scheme where the upfront cost is borne by the um, container operating company or the platform company that facilitates the energy as a service. And just like we do in our homes and, and many businesses, we pay for what we use and we don't pay for anything that we don't use. So this again is gonna be really key in reducing the total cost of ownership and addressing the challenges set out in the call. Thank you, Sean, for uh, for your answer and Jerome as well. So um, actually, maybe and this one might be also connected to to your answer to your previous question. Um, maybe uh, also this one could be addressed first to Sean and then to uh, Jerome again. So uh, in your in, I mean, uh, I think this one we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, right? The two projects overall goals is to electrify the marine industries. So um, uh, my question would be, in your opinion, which are the major roadblocks that prevent uh, the electrification of uh, uh, marine industry? So yeah, we, I touched on a couple of them, but yeah, there's a few we can elaborate on. Um, as I say, production inefficiencies. Um, we really need to get economies of scale up within the maritime industry. We need to see the, the demand driving the supply. Um, we need to be offering end users a solution that's clear, uh, not confusing. I think if I'm an end user and I'm looking at my alternative fuel options, I'm looking at fuel cells, I'm looking at batteries, it's, it's very unclear uh, and there's not a clear business case either way. So helping end users unravel that puzzle and coming up with convincing business cases and coordinating of financial models as well. Part of our investigations has shown that it's very unlikely that end users will finance the transition on their own um, and the investment tools are not there to unlock mass exploitation. So coming up with a business model or working in partnership with EU funding mechanisms or EIB funding mechanisms is going to be really important as well. We're going to work a lot on standardizing interfaces so that uh, if you're looking at a swappable solution from current direct or a swappable solution from a competitor product, um, you're not facing the challenge of complete infrastructure change on your vessel. So the idea that we would have standardized plug and socket arrangements, standardized mechanical locking arrangements, standardized voltages, all these things that will help proliferate swappable battery solutions in the industry. Um, we need to get over those road blockers and come up with a, a really compelling business case as well. I agree with uh, with what Sean said, of course, that then I see it, it even bigger. The standardization is, of course, a critical element uh, and the swappable batteries is one of the solutions, but we see the battery technology behind uh, as also one of the, the critical roadblocks today. I think I demonstrated how CBAT can contribute to that, which actually, if you, if you think of it, it a battery is just a component in a ship, but then that battery needs to be integrated. Uh, that should be somehow standardized or should be somehow clear. The battery needs to uh, connect to the shore. Uh, so the connector needs to be there. Uh, it needs to be charged. Uh, so the grid connection needs to be there or another system needs to be there to provide energy. So there's really an entire chain which needs to, which needs to exist uh, for the battery, for electrification, at least with batteries to happen. And I think Peter also mentioned that in, in his uh, presentation earlier today, that in the Horizon Europe uh, calls that are now also um, topics such as the charging being tackled. So there are a multitude of roadblocks which we are uh, which we are taking away one by one. And I think the current direct project and CBAT project are uh, are taking away a lot of them already, uh, but there will be plenty remaining. Thank you, Jeron. So uh, now I would like to uh, to involve you, Caetano, uh, for uh, for for the next question, uh, since so, since also your position in uh, uh, in CBAT. So um, I think this was also briefly mentioned in Jeron's presentation, in which um, 
it's clear that it's quite important to have also external partners uh, that contribute to the to to achieve these projects. Uh, sorry, to achieve the project results. So, um, could you elaborate a little bit on how are you planning to involve them and uh, uh, how can they they how can they contribute to it? Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Thomas, for the question. Of course, uh, all those external partners who want to contribute to to CBAN, uh, can become part of our stakeholder advisory board, which is still open. And uh, as a member of uh, our advisory board, uh, any external entity may uh, actively participate if they want in the uh, development of the project, providing guidance and advice to, to CBAT, guaranteeing the newly developed solutions, as Jerome has explained before perfectly, uh, and make them economically attractive and suitable to be introduced into the waterport transport sector. Uh, also, uh, including in this aspect, both both projects. Uh, I, our stakeholders also will be able to contribute, identifying uh, the correct engagement strategy, encourage the use of new battery systems, and help address challenges that uh, arise during the, the development of, of the project, as Jerome has said, with the three different uh, technologies or uh, of, of configuration of, of our uh, batteries. Just to remark that at this uh, time we have uh, 17 entities forming our stakeholder advisory board, including clusters, shipyards, uh, battery manufacturers and, and design firms of uh, relevant uh, renown. And also uh, considering the, the potential of the solution proposed by, by CBAT, we also have the active participation of the Spanish National Administration, specifically the, the Ministry of, of Industry. And recently, uh, the Maritime Battery Forum uh, has joined our stakeholder advisory board. And that, that's all for my part. Thank you, Caetano. So um, the next question I, I, I would like to involve you, Emilius. So um, in, uh, in Sean's presentation, uh, it's, it's evident that uh, uh, within Current Direct, the Energy as a Service platform is a quite important component of, of the project itself. So um, um, how will this, uh, this platform uh, use novel technologies uh, to pave the way for a sustainable battery swapping business model? Could you please uh, elaborate on that? Yes, of course. Thank you, Tommaso, for the question. First of all, my apologies again for the internet connection problems at the office and the upheaval due to that, to the previous question. Uh, regarding this one, uh, under the framework of Current Direct, uh, ASRAE uh, will lead the development of state-of-the-art algorithms for the energy as a service platform that, as you say, it will utilize novel technology to pave the way for a sustainable business model. For those who might not have totally understood yet, the energy as a service platform is how I like to call it, the brain behind the battery swapping model we introduce. It is a cloud-based platform that controls, manages, coordinates and optimizes the work cycle of a battery swapping network and it is so significant uh, for the unhindered operation of the current direct project and what we're trying to do. Um, as you can understand uh, regarding the how it uses those technologies, uh, innovation and research projects don't materialize out of nowhere. Thus, before getting started on configuring and developing a battery swapping network for waterborne transport, it is important to gather published information and materials on related topics. Uh, in this regard, uh, the concept of the current direct energy service model incorporates ground battery swapping, waterborne transport procedures and revenue management methods. We must investigate and actually we've already had those three different sectors in depth. Up till now, battery swapping has been mainly approached from the perspective of electric vehicles as an alternative way of re-energizing electric mobility. So we have to gain a complete overview of battery swapping models and cases in EVs. Also, we need a complete overview of the operational environment of waterborne transports 
in order to develop our battery swapping models into it. And of course, we need to incorporate in the platform high revenue management techniques to proceed to a cost optimization to reach the main goal of the project, which is to lower the cost of battery systems for waterborne transports. Um, so in overall, I can say that that's the field that the energy service platform uh, will utilize to develop its methodologies, its innovative methodologies. I hope to cover your topic. Thank you, Emilius. It was uh, it was definitely covered. So um, uh, I, I can see there is uh, uh, one other question from uh, uh, the Q and A, which uh, should be uh, addressed maybe by by you, Sean. So um, there is a question on the order of magnitude uh, of the cost um, that we expect for covering. Uh, sorry, for converting to an an, an electric drive. Is it something, Sean, that you um, uh, it has already been discussed within Current Direct? Thanks, Tommaso. No, excellent question. Thank you. It it depends. Um, so I cannot give you a, a, a single figure because it really depends on the vessel in question. Uh, absolutely, part of our business modeling and total cost of ownership modeling is to consider the costs associated with retrofitting a vessel. But if we take two examples, if we're looking at a, a short sea uh, Ropax ferry versus a uh, inland waterway vessel, the relative cost is vastly different. I think what's important here is helping owners understand how to best use their investments or leverage any financing mechanisms they may have available to them so that we can help them understand what the costs associated with a retrofit would be. And this is an area we are engaging with industry to see if there is an appetite of offering a business model that would fund some of the, if not all of the retrofit costs and then bundle those costs into the energy as a service platform. So we could offer a compelling business case to uh, a single vessel operator or even a, a conglomerate operating tens or hundreds of vessels. Uh, of a financing package that then falls into a leasing arrangement with the energy as a service. Um, it's clear that certainly on the inland waterway market, the, it is a very old fleet. Uh, we know that um, hulls are very old. However, they have kept pace in many cases with engine regulations. So there comes a point of when is it economical to re-engine an old hull? or when is it economical to invest in a new hull with a new electrified propulsion train? On the short sea shipping and coastal shipping it tends to be a more modern fleet, uh, a lot more proliferation of diesel electric. So the retrofit piece changes again where maybe it's not a whole rip out and reinstall, but it's a modification of an existing propulsion train. So I don't have a, a single figure. I don't have a single answer. It is something we are investigating under the project and we would look to share under what we cover under work package eight, which is the financing and business models for the energy as a service package. So happy to to connect with the, uh, the questioner of that particular question and, and discuss that further. Thank you, Sean. So. Um, I think uh, your answer will also be connected to uh, the retrofit topic that Sean mentioned, and I have a question specifically for Jeron connected to to C. But so um, within this project, we we, we will uh, we will demonstrate the feasibility of a C. But concept. But uh, um, how how are you planning to to extend this solution to the to the rest of the world fleet? Uh, do you know if it's uh, if it's already compatible or there are some additional developments that should be should be done? Well, first of all, from a technical point of view, I think it's important to uh, to keep in the back of our minds that the modular solution makes the makes the hybrid battery or the CBAT solution scalable. So in that sense, from a technical point of view, we will do our very best to make it as suitable as possible for a large variety of different ship types. That being said, I think it's clear that uh, the primary target group are, are ferries, uh, offshore supply ships, uh, fishing vessels also prove to be interesting from our application matrix and then short range rates and uh, also inland waterway transport. So will be a bit of a competitor for the current direct solution as well. 
Uh, and then to extend further and to achieve this practically, uh, the intent is that we involve as many ship builders and as many partners from the value chain as possible already throughout the project. So as Caetano laid out, our stakeholder group is, is important and is quite wide so that we can actually get this information, get this design uh, as close to the ones who actually need it uh, as possible. And that should really help uh, and support the, the idea of this, this new concept and make sure that it, that it gets uh, taken up by the market. Uh, one of the major things we see as an issue there uh, will, be, will be regulation. Uh, so we also need to make steps uh, in making sure that the regulatory uh, bodies are, are also in the loop and can update whatever is required uh, so, that we, so that this solution can actually, can actually work. And then of course standardization uh, is also a major, um, major element in the way forward in implementing, well, actually any solution uh, for the battery, uh, for the battery market, and especially for the CBAT solution. Thanks for your uh, for your answers, Jeron. So um, I have one uh, one final question for Karen Direct, and then I have uh, one uh, to let's say close uh, this discussion. Um, so maybe this one could uh, could could be asked to you, Sean. So um, Karen Direct has uh, um, this uh, very creative solution for uh, battery charging, which is the swappable battery containers which uh, we know, for example, swappable bat batteries have been applied in the past for electric vehicles, but it's quite an, uh, an innovative idea on uh, in the waterborne sector. So I, I, I wanted to know from you, uh, if you if you have already a, a view and an opinion on how the industry uh, respond to this uh, to this proposed idea. It's it's an interesting question, and and actually, if you start looking and you start digging, it whilst it is innovative, it is not original. Um, so it, there is some precedence for it, and um, there's a project in commercial operations now that is uh, trailblazing the elements of swappable battery solutions, and we uh, are looking to work very closely with that project um, as well. But yes, the concept has been discussed for many years. Um, I think what's different here is we're really trying to make a go of it and really trying to find a solution that is um, pleasing, you know, not only to the European Commission, but also to the end users. We spent a lot of this year and this event, event included in raising the profile of the concept, disseminating and explaining the concept to a wide range of stakeholders. Um, we've particip participated in it in numerous industry events. Um, and I think we, we're kind of getting a bit of a momentum now with people taking the concept into consideration when they're looking at future ship designs now. And there are some designs on the drawing board. We've discussed with some ship owners that have a space provision for a swappable container solution, be it battery, uh, fuel cell or, or engine. So I'm really starting to get a good feel that this idea is taking hold. Um, on the whole, the reaction has been extremely positive. A lot of questions, which has been um, evidenced here today, a lot of intrigue when we start looking beyond the vessel into the network. Um, we've got thousands of kilometers of inland waterway to consider with thousands of vessels, uh, potential market applicability, and that's just on the inland waterway network. As we dig deeper into the short sea and coastal fleet, I think we will again prick an interest in ferry owners and ROPAX owners who really want to understand how could they exploit this technology for their own zero emission or absolute zero emission operations. As we enter 2022 and draw 21 to a close, we will be looking to share much more detail than we maybe have done today and, and really share the exploitable results. We'll have more to share on the cell development, more to share on the applicability. So I would definitely encourage anybody listening today or interested in this technology to sign up um, through our website, follow us on LinkedIn and just be part of the discussion. Um, we will achieve this project through strong input from everybody who seeks to have an interest in this project. Um, so yes, please reach us out. Thank you, Sean. So uh, I have one uh, one final question, which I think is also 
uh, one of the of the main goals uh, why we we hosted this webinar together with Karen Direct and Cbats. So um, as as we mentioned at the beginning, as as was presented by Peter Crowley, we are uh, financed under the same call, and uh, it was evident that we had quite some common ob objectives. So um, I would like to, I would like to ask first maybe Jerome and then uh, Sean if you would like to to give your inputs. Um, which are the synergies that you identify between the the two projects? Maybe this could be a good starting point to start to to have a more uh, let's say close discussion together. Thank you. Thanks, Tommaso. Uh, thanks for giving me the word first because that gives me the opportunity <laughs> to. to uh, to tackle a lot of things which I think the both of us will agree on. Um, to start with, indeed, we, we share the same call, we share the same topic, and, and you can see that we share the same objectives, but uh, as was also evident from the presentations, we do take quite a different route in getting there. Um, well, CPAT is focusing very much on, on the battery, uh, on a new battery, te battery technology or a new battery system, and then taking the required steps on, on producing this battery, on standardization, standardization on regulation. Uh, Current Direct is taking much more the route of the energy as a service, which I agree with is a very, very interesting and, and good way uh, of also reducing the cost. So I think in that sense, we are, we are very compatible. It's funny even that, that um, Current Direct is targeting a new battery cell type, uh, which is targeted towards the marine industry, while we try to keep the cell type as open as possible, uh, such that we are compatible with a variety of different cells. So that actually means that we could consider the uh, current direct cell as a high energy cell in our hybrid architecture. And I think as well, we could introduce our battery in the proposed energy uh, as a service system. So in that sense, I think we are we are very compatible. Now we're also both targeting part of the standardization of, and the regulation. So I do believe we need to tackle that challenge uh, definitely with, with joint means. Uh, there is no need in defining two different standards that would uh, <laughs> that would complicate matters even more than they are today. Uh, but for that, clearly, uh, it's good that we do this together, uh, that we did this presentation together, but also that we continue to collaborate in the future, which is uh, an idea that's both shared between uh, between current director Sibats and between myself and Sean uh, personally. Sean, would you like to add something on uh, on top of Jerome's? I agree completely with your own. It's been clear today and I hope it's come across well to those watching that they are very complementary projects. And, and if I was in the industry, I would be looking to follow these two very closely because I believe that both will deliver innovation that can benefit um, different segments of the market. Um, Clearly, there's a focus on the standardization. I, I, I agree with that, Jerome, um, particularly around regulation. So working with our respective partners, uh, Lloyds and Rena, and getting them to lobby on behalf of our, our projects across the, the industry is going to be a, a crucial part. Uh, we don't want to overcomplicate an already complicated landscape. Um, Identifying the market needs, um, we're really interested in what CBAT are doing, um, looking at how possibly battery systems are oversized um, for a target life that maybe doesn't exist anymore in the maritime industry. We need to have systems that are fit for the entire life of the vessel, whether that means swapping out midway through the, the application. We're clearly targeting inland waterway and coastal shipping. But as a product, any one of these innovations could be spun off into, um, if I take an example, the cell is a good example, is not limited to a current direct container, could well find its way into uh, a, a fixed installation. Uh, some of our innovations around battery management system will serve Spear well with their product offering. So we will continue that good working relationship with CBAT. We will continue to find more and deeper ways to collaborate uh, and harmonize between the two projects. And I think events like this are really, really, really useful and welcome um, across across the uh, European Commission with the support from Peter to show how the investment made by them can really make a difference 
Um, so yes, we, we look forward to more of this type of event, Jerome, and working deeper on those areas where we have strong collaboration. Thank you, Sean, for uh, for your answer. So um, we just reached the uh, the end of the session. I think we had uh, enough questions uh, from uh, from me and also from uh, from the audience. So um, I want to tell uh, I, I want to thank all of our speakers for uh, for their availability and for being here to share your knowledge. I think it was a very uh, good discussion and a lot of uh, uh, follow up points that will need to be tackled. Uh, secondly, I also want to to uh, to thank my team from EDP new and from EDP in general that helped me organize this webinar. And also last but not least, I would like to th uh, thank all, all the attendees for being here. Uh, we hope uh, uh, you found this discussion interesting and uh, we look forward for uh, uh, next engagements. Um, I wish you all a good afternoon and uh, thank you again. Bye bye.